regarding the test, so I just finished it up. You're doing 50 multiple choice again, okay, worth one point each, and you're going to have seven short answers. Seven, Mercer, seven. Okay? So I thought it'd be nice here and point you out to a couple things that I think you really should be paying attention to. Okay? One of the things would be specimen selection, collection, transport, and processing of anaerobes. That's an actual slide. It reads that, okay? Specimen selection, collection, transport, and processing of anaerobes. So that, that's actually, I think, the title of the actual slide, okay? Um, the swabbing aspects of anaerobes. Okay, there was a couple things on that slide that pertained just to the swabbing process and what you do and don't do with swabbing. Okay, um, rapid tests for identifying anaerobes. And then anaerobic problems in susceptibility testing. In susceptibility testing. Okay. You got that? Yep. Okay. Testing. Yeah. Another one um, to look at the slide is um, the increased vibrio infections. Like, why is there an increase in vibrio infections? Um, again, Vibrio identification would be another one. And then I would also look at clinical manifestations associated with air modus. Associated with air modus. Okay. All right, any questions on those? So I would be paying attention to those particular slides in general, okay? They could be a lot of multiple choice, they could be some short answers from there, but those are important slides for the test, okay? The other thing that I want you guys to pay attention to as well are some of these things that are written up on the board here. Um, they're kind of scattered, but they're within like the framework of the three different um, sections that we have to cover. So for chlamydia, um, the cycle involves two forms, and just to know the difference between the elementary body, which is infectious, and the reticulum body, which is not infectious, okay? And then also, the EB, or elementary body, has this outer membrane, which is very similar to a gram-negative um, membrane, but it's called MOP, or MOP, <laughs> MOP, M-O-M-P. Um, Major outer membrane protein is basically what it is, but it functions kind of like a gram negative where um, it can have toxins and that type of thing, okay? And then lab diagnosis for chlamydia is gonna depend on the prevalence in the population, okay? And that's how they're gonna determine which method or combination of methods should be used, okay? So that would be some of the major points of chlamydia which are in your PowerPoint. Okay, this gives you a little bit more detail. Okay, so if you move on, you have rickettsia. Rickettsia is interesting because it's, it's going to be divided into three groups, basically. And the groups are according to clinical infections. So that's how they do it. It's not by antigens or anything like that. It's going to be what clinical infections or manifestations does the rickettsia cause. Okay. So some of them I went through here, and it would be good to know the difference between these. The Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is probably considered the worst one that you could get. Um, it's actually a reportable disease as well. But it's flu-like rash. Um, you can get a rash, but the rash usually doesn't affect the face, as some of them will affect the face, okay? But in terms of flu-like, it just lasts a very long time. The person just isn't feeling well for a long time and then it's kind of hard to detect so the person goes on feeling sick for a long time. Um, Rickettsial pox. This one is similar to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever but it's a lot more mild 
in terms of what they're feeling symptom-wise, but they do get a rash on the face, usually with this one, okay? And then you have the typhus, um, fever, headache, and usually there's no rash. And then you have the lausborn or lice, similar again to Rocky Mountain spotted fever symptoms. And on this too, the face can also be affected. It's not affected every time, but sometimes it can be. So that would be a difference between Rocky Mountain spotted fever, because you really don't get that rash on the face. Okay, so you guys clear about the differences here? Okay, all right, moving on to Vibrio. Parahemolyticus, which is a salt water uh, bacterium, um, has this thing that it can cause, kind of phenomenon, I don't even know if I said that right. Okay, that's associated with Parahemolyticus. And basically, it's able to produce, you can read it, he's, heat stable hemolysin, and it can lyse in salt medium that has really salt high content, okay? So parahemolyticus is associated with that. So just I would remember the association there. And then aromonas, what's interesting about aromonas is that it's actually divided into two groups. You have the mesophilic and the psychrophilic, okay? So there's three groups in the mesophilic, which would be around 37 degrees Celsius, Psychrophilic, like there's one group, it's 22 to 25 degrees Celsius. But that's actually how they're divided. You have these two groups. So that's pretty important as well. Okay? All right. Plasmonis, um, three major types of clinical gas gastroenteritis. You can have common, just watery diarrhea. Okay? There's one that's subacute slash chronic, depending on if you fall into is it 14 days, or it can be sometimes two to three months that the person's experiencing this. And then you can have invasive dysenteric uh, diarrhea. So those three, it goes into those categories, okay? And then the non-fermenters, these are the basic characteristics right here, which is interesting because you can see um, a lot of times pigmentation, think of, um, Pseudomonas, when it's grown supposedly on TSA or something, you can see it's like green blue, right? So it has pigmentation. Um, some of them can or cannot grow on a Mac, and most of them are going to be oxidase positive, which this is something I want to bring up because if you're thinking that you might have Pseudomonas for your unknown, an oxidase test would probably be a good idea to run, right? Because the rest of the Enterobacteriaceae, are they oxidase positive or negative? They're negative. So that would differentiate Pseudomonas right there. Okay? So that would be something I would kind of keep my eye on. Um, modal, they're oxidase and catalase positive. You're going to see growth on MAC, and they can be oxidizers of different types of carbs. Okay? So that would be the Pseudomonas group. All right. Um, let's see. So this is talking about the cycles again, the EB infectious cycle with the MOMP and the RB non-infectious cycle, okay? And I talked about that already. So these are obligate intracellular parasites. Okay, let's talk about trichomonas first. This is going to be a serious, serious eye infection. It's actually the number one cause of blindness in the world, okay? Seen in climates with hot or high temperatures and high humidity. Um, and it's the most commonly transmitted bacterial pathogen, which is pretty interesting. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is I used to make my 2010 class read this book talking about uh, basically like small epidemics. And when the Jews came over and they went to Ellis Island, what they did was supposedly they were at risk for having trichomonas so what they would do is they would line them up and then they would flip open their eyelid. So you can see it on the eyelid. It's very red and almost scratchy looking. So they'd flip open the eyelid, but they would use a hanger to do it. And then it, they'd go to the next person with the hanger and the next person with the hanger and they weren't um, sterilizing it. So what do you think happened? Oh, they all got it. And then it was like this big deal and they got sent back. So this happened in, in uh, Ellis Island a long time ago, but just a little interesting thing there. Um, other urogenital diseases, PID, which would be pelvic inflammatory disease, and Reader's syndrome. 
That's basically your right through your I can't say that. Your rethritis, okay? Um, and you can have conjunctivitis and lesions, um, which can cause infertility, okay? And then also you can have uh, chlamydia infection in the newborn as well. So how are they going to do lab diagnosis? This is what I was saying before. The knowledge of the population at risk, they need to know that. Um, what's the capability of the facilities available for testing? Mercer, look at this. The cost of the assays. Okay? <laughs> how much is it going to cost? Um, the ability to batch specimen types. And then what's the experience of the laboratory scientists doing it? So it's not a really easy thing to identify. Um, if you want to go more into depth, they're looking at direct microscopic examination, of course. Particularly, they're looking for, when you're talking about like trachoma and conjunctivitis, columnar epithelia cells will be present, okay, for those two. They'll also run cell culture and amino assays, and they have nucleic acid. There's also antibody detection. So there's like a big variety of different things that they can use uh, for diagnosis. All right, pneumonia, okay? Um, interestingly, on this one, that the 90% of the infections are asymptomatic or basically mildly symptomatic, okay? Um, this just gives you sort of a background on what sort of happens when somebody has it. One of the things that's also interesting on this slide is that fever is usually uncommon, okay? So pay attention to that. Uh, clinical infections, you can get community acquired, and it's linked to chronic diseases or illnesses such as coronary heart disease, which is pretty fascinating. So um, remember that as well. That's an important detail right there, okay? On lab <coughs> diagnosis, okay, they'll culture it on cell lines first, okay? Um, there's two antibody response patterns. Basically what that means is that on the primary response, there's CF antibodies are seen first, but if you have reinfection, CF is not even detected, okay? So there's two different patterns that it will follow. And then the serological tests are the method of choice for diagnosis, okay? All right, rickettsia. All right, now remember on this one, it's divided into groups. This is your basic list right here, but it's going to be divided into groups based on clinical infections, okay? There's just a picture of what some of the rashes would actually look like. Usually it's on the trunk and the extremities, and like I said, on some of them it will move to the face, um, and some of them it won't move to the face, all right? But it's a pretty severe rash. Um, diagnosis. Interestingly for this one, um, it should only be identified in the bios biosafety level three lab, okay? And then you have your list right there of different um, uh, detection methods. The IFA test, that's considered the gold standard method for antibody detection for rickettsia, okay? So that's pretty important as well, so IFA. Okay, coxiella. Does anybody know before I switch, you have your sheet in front of you, I'm sure. What is coxiella cause? Anybody? Ever, anybody ever heard of this Q fever? No? Okay, so um, Q fever is highly contagious, right? And you can get it from unpasteurized milk, which is a risk factor. Um, basically, really lethargic, flu like symptoms, high fever. Um, so, Coxiella bernetti is actually the only species of this genus. It's an obligate intracellular parasite. And look again, direct immunofluorescent assays of the infected tissue are used, and they also use the IFA test again with this one. And this is still considered a biosafety level three that they need to look at in the lab. Okay? Okay, good for you, good for you, good for you. All right, with these, you want to remember that some of the organisms, such as Vibrio cholera, I'm sure you guys know that, are going to be associated with pandemics and epidemics, right? Um, then you have other stuff in here, like Campylobacter jejuni can cause uh, Julian Barre syndrome, which is also another problem. And then you have Helicobacter, again, 
which can cause gastric ulcers. So there's a lot of these that do kind of pretty heavy duty damage, okay? But in terms of Vibrio, um, you're going to find them in a wide variety of aquatic environments, meaning fresh water, salt water, um, particularly salt water. Um, they're also going to be pretty temperature sensitive, so they're going to decline in the winter months. They seem to thrive in the summer months. Um, and a lot of people end up getting infections either from wounds or um, from eating like raw oysters or that type of thing. Um, immunocompromised or people that have liver disease are, should be particularly careful with vibrios. And the other thing to remember is that there's 12 species found in human specimen from vibrios. Okay, so there's 12. Okay, so that's a picture of vibrios right there. Um, the pandemics of cholera have been documented since 1817 in Bangladesh. Okay, so why are there increased infections? You guys can read this. This is just a general increase in the number of cases of Vibrio, and it's going to include the following reasons right here. Basically, you're going to have the travel, which is a big one, to coastal or cholera endemic areas. Okay. The one that it really affects us here in the United States would be the increased consumption of seafood, raw or undercooked, particularly oysters, okay? Um, increased use of recreational water facilities, and then, of course, we're dealing with larger populations of immunocompromised individuals, which then they're at risk for getting an infection. All right, and then what does it do, clinical manifestations? Um, vibrio infection is the presence of certain recognized factors such as, um, and it goes again, recent consumption, recent immigration or foreign travel, gastroenteritis, and what they call it is rice water stools. Have you guys heard that one before with cholera? It literally looks like rice, okay? And then accidental trauma, which can open it up to wound infections. Okay. There's an actual picture of it. You're going to possess polar flagella sheathed in bra and unsheathed on solid media. Okay? They are basically pleomorphic. Um, let's see. All there's the 12 species are all oxidase positive. Okay? Um, let's go to cholera, which O1 is the actual cholera toxin. And it's a problem in developing countries. And this goes back again to the rice border stools. Um, you're going to be prevalent in like India and Bangladesh, and it's acute diarrheal disease. And you're spreading it through contaminated water. So, like when you have the tsunami and that type of thing, that's when you have a real big problem with secondary um, infections here with cholera. Okay? So, it's going to be severe, severe, severe gastroenteritis. Um, with vomiting and then the rice water stool. I heard a story once that in developing countries they actually have beds lined up and there's a hole in the middle of the bed and then just a bucket on the floor for people because it's that bad. They can't get up but they just go to the bathroom in this bucket. And then that sounds real sanitary, doesn't it? But that's in developing countries. Okay. This is my favorite guy, Parachemolyticus. Okay, this one is the second most common implicated in gastroenteritis. Um, it's usually on coastal areas. And this is the guy that is always, you turn to this one when you have some kind of infection and you've just eaten like raw oysters. It usually has to do with this, okay? Um, what else? Um, it's also what they call summer diarrhea in Japan, which is interesting. Um, but it's generally self-limiting infection. It's watery diarrhea, moderate cramps and vomiting, and slight fever. Okay, so it's not as bad as actually having cholera, per se. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. And also remember about the K phenomenon. Okay, that that's what's associated with it out of the vibrios. It's parahemolyticus. All right, vulnificus. There's where it hangs out. Um, its cause is primary septicemia and really heavy duty wound infections, which is not fun. Um, and it also can lead to cellulitis, okay? 
which can progress to necrotizing fasciitis. And the thing about this one that sort of differentiates it from the other ones is that it's a lactose fermenter. Okay, so that's a pretty important detail right there. Okay, um, in general, let's look at the actual identification. You're going to use something that's called TCBS auger to actually isolate vibrios. Okay, now as you can see, the bile salt sucrose right there. Um, it's going to have positive, positive oxidase reaction, and that will separate them from the Enterobacteraceae. And of course, they can withstand the really high salt content. So like vibrios would be fine, you can grow them out on MSAs, it wouldn't be a problem. And the salt content, they can actually um, tolerate some salt that's even higher than that. I think that would be like 80%. Um, the other thing that they want to do as well is you want to get the stool samples collected before there's administration of any antimicrobial agents, okay? Um, let's see. Also, they don't like to use buffered glycerol saline at all with vibrios um, during the transport because the glycerol is actually toxic for the vibrios, okay? So that's a no-no in the transport. But remember about the TCBS auger, I would say, would be the most important right there, okay? All right, Aramonis, okay? Aramonis is a little different. This guy can grow in any range from 4 to 42 degrees Celsius. So it's not temperature sensitive. And then you can see it has the mesophilic and cyprophilic groups. Okay? Um, widely distributed water-wise, again, um, animal and meat products can be isolated from. Uh, and then it's oxidase positive and glucose fermenting as well. Okay, but the big thing here is that it can grow in a range of uh, temperature. That's just an actual infection on a fish um, that would be aromonis. Okay. Okay. Clinical manifestations. You have a ton of clinical manifestations here for aromonis, and this is one of the ones that I told you to keep your eye out for for the test. Okay. Um, intestinal infections from aquatic exposure. Mostly uh, acute diarrhea is usually what happens with vomiting, but it can actually progress to dysenteric form of diarrhea. And then you can have chronic, which would mean that it lasted more than 10 days. And unfortunately with this one as well, it can turn into rice water stools if the diarrhea is that bad, okay? Extra intestinal infections. This can also cause septicemia, meningitis, and wound infections. This would be a result from traumatic aquatic exposure, meaning that you were in the water and something happened and you got a wound infection from the water, okay, which then can lead to cellulitis, which won't be fun. On lab diagnosis, it's beta hemolytic on a BAP and it has lactose fermentation on a MAC. However, um, the oxidase, again, will distinguish it from the Enterobacteraceae. That is extra intestinal infections. Yeah, do you need me to go back? No, no, I was just saying that the diagnosis is extra intestinal infections. Yeah. Well, the, this would be in general, not necessarily just for that. This would be in general, but they're going to look for in the lab. They'll run this stuff. Okay? We're not on Vibrio. This is air bonus. This is air bonus. Okay? All right. Plesomonas. I don't know why my picture is so small, but there you go. I'm sure you can really see it. Okay. That one's oxidase positive again. Um, facultative anaerobe. This one's closely related to Enterobacteraceae. Okay. Um, you're going to find it in soil and aquatic environments, usually tropical climates. Again, we're talking about gastroenteritis. And then that's what I put on the board about there's three categories. The first one would be water diarrhea, and then the third one would go all the way down to dysentery or invasive disease. Okay? Um, cases are underreported usually because it's so similar, similar to E. coli in most enteric media. So that's going to be a problem. Okay? So there's probably actually a lot more cases, but most of the time they think they're dealing with E. coli. Now, on lab diagnosis, um, 
brilliant green biosalts can enhance the isolation. So that would be another thing. And again, it's going to be positase oxidative or positase oxidase, which is going to separate it from something like E. coli. Okay. Um, there's no spores or capsules in this guy, um, and he's modal by flagella. All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that it's not going to grow in TCBS. That was the one for vibrios, okay? But actually, it will grow in something called CIN, which is actually specific for yersinia. Do you remember yersinia way back when? No? What does that mean? TCBS? No, no. That was CIN. It will grow on CIN, which is kind of bizarre. We actually have samples of CIN. I can show you what those look like. They basically look like uh, TSA plates. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Campylobacter. This one, what's cool about it, it's microaerophilic, um, the most common cause of bacterial gastroenteritis worldwide. A lot of times from chicken. Um, they also throw Helicobacter pylori under Campylobacter, which is why it's listed here. Um, and that one, as you guys know, would be associated with gastric and uh, peptic ulcers. Okay? Um, let's see. Clinical manifestations. Jejuni is the one that we're talking about for Campylobacter that's usually found in chicken. Uh, mild abdominal pain, and then you get followed by cramps, and you can actually have bloody diarrhea. Then the problem is you have the Julian Barre syndrome, which can happen, and that's basically an autoimmune disorder. Okay, and you can have paralysis with that autoimmune disorder. Okay, and then of course, Helicobacter pylori, gastric infections, and then you have type B, there's a link between that and gastric cancer. Okay. And that one, again, is a hard one to diagnose. This one is a picture of Helicobacter pylori right here. Okay. Um, for specimen collection transport of these guys, you're going to do stool samples, and the rectal swabs will be less preferred. Um, if there's a delay in transport, they like to use carry glare media. Okay. Uh, Helicobacter pylori can be recovered from gastric bi biopsy materials. And they do the other thing that I was telling you guys the other day, the urea breath test for that. Um, and Stewart media will maintain the viability of both Campylobacter and Helicobacter. Okay, so that's another media that's been thrown into the mix here. Okay, the lab diagnosis. Campy BAT is used to isolate jejuni. And then Helicobacter, you can use chocolate, but it's going to be selective on Skiro's auger. Okay? That's basically just grown for Helicobacter. Um, and then, of course, they both like microaerophilic environment with increased humidity. And Jejuni grows best if it's incubated at 42. Okay? Okay. All right. Last diagnosis. Campylobacter is oxidase positive. You're going to be looking at the gram stain morphology because it has this weird curved S shape and the motility. It sort of stains poorly, so carbon fusion is recommended as a counter stain. Okay, that's for Campylobacter. For Helicobacter, you're talking about non culture methods, the rapid urease, the presumptive ID, that's the test that I was talking to you about, about the breath test. And on that one, they also like to use something called the Christian's urea media if they're suspecting that it's helicobacter. Okay? Um, one of the things that I do want to mention to you guys to remember is that most of these species are found in fresh and marine water. Okay? Remember that TCBS would be the medium of choice for a vibrio. Um, and Aeromonas and several types has several types of diarrhea and extra interstitial um, infections as well. Okay? All right. Non fermenting and miscellaneous gram negatives. And seriously, if any of you guys need me after we're done here to go over your notes or whatever or to ask me to do flashcards or something, I'm available. Like, we're going to get it done early. Okay? But I would actually take me up on that instead of skirt by with like a bad grade. Okay? Maybe there's a way that we can adjust what you're doing and help you out. Okay? 
that's my like pep speech for the day. And I'm exhausted now. <laughs> All right. So for non-permitting and miscellaneous gram negatives, you guys saw that the list up there that um, the characteristics was motility, pigmentation, and then ability or lack of ability to grow on like MAC auger. And then most of them are oxidase positive, okay? Which is why I'm gonna say it and say it again, that if you're suspecting that you might have pseudomonas, I would probably wanna run an oxidase test because you're, the rest of them that you're working with are um, oxidase negative, okay? Some of the other general characteristics are listed right here. Um, again, oxidase positive for most of them, and they prefer moist environments, not dry environments. If you think of pseudomonas, that would make sense. It kind of like slithers around and it's sort of like this biofilm. Um, they also can tend to be resistant to multiple classes of antimicrobials, which is a big problem, okay? Um, and then they fail to acidify OF tubes and TSI. So you're not really going to get a good result. And I know we didn't do pseudomonas on a TSI, but that would be right there. It says it. It's going to fail to acidify on a TSI. Okay? So that would be your result for the TSI and pseudomonas. Got it? All right. Um, clinical infections. These guys are going to account for 15% of all gram-negative bacilli isolated from clinical assessment, which is kind of a big number. Um, everything from septicemia to wound infections here. Um, your at-risk population would be immunosuppression, trauma, or foreign body implants, such as like a catheter, um, and if they're doing infused uh, fluids. Usually, if the person gets infected, they were hospitalized or they got recently discharged. Okay? It just depends. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Okay. Can I open this tower now? Yeah, you can. Then Yay. we'll make sure you sell that. All right. Let's put me to good mood. Okay, good. All right. Biochemical characteristics and ID. There's your morphology. Okay? Um, in terms of oxidase, you have some that can be weak or variable. And that's basically pseudomonas. When you do pseudomonas, I just did it in the lab this morning. It isn't like a boom purple. It just takes a little while and you'll see it around the edges. Okay? Um, and again, no acid production on a TSI or KIA. KIA is similar to a TSI. And again, resistant to multiple antimicrobials. That's actually a picture of Pseudomonas, okay? So Pseudomonas aeginosa. Um, leading cause of nosocomial respiratory tract infections. That's important. Um, third most common cause of gram-negative bacillary bacteremia, also important. Then you have less serious infections, such as ear infections, or what they call hot tub syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's kind of funny infections from the hot tub, you actually get this necrotizing rash skin infection, um, which is not so good. <laughs> so yeah, hangs out in hot tubs, like that. Um, in terms of virulence factors, your most important would be exotoxin A. That's going to block protein synthesis, okay? Um, it has pili, it has a capsule, a lot of times mucoid colonies. However, I would kind of argue with that and say that it's basically more like biofilm colonies, okay? Well, not colonies, just biofilm. Sometimes you can't even tell that you have it on a plate until you swab it. Um, so it eats everything up. But identifying characteristics. There is the blue water soluble pigment that I was talking about, okay? Which it's supposed to do on auger. Um, beta hemolytic on a VAP, it has supposedly a grape-like odor, um, and it can grow at 42. And then there's also this specific auger called centromide auger that is used. And what that one does is it enhances the pigment of pseudomonas, whereas some of the other ones might not so much. Okay? The Cintobacter, um, this is going to be an opportunistic pathogen. You can see what it's associated with right there. This one, however, look at that, it's oxidase negative, um, but catalase positive. 
and it has lower temperatures of preference, 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, and its pH is a little weird as well, 5.5 to 6. Um, sometimes they can appear as gram-positive cocci in smears made from blood culture bottles, which is a problem in identification. Um, and they're capable of growing on most media. And on most media, um, they'll produce purplish colors, which makes it look like they're lactose from an ad, which in fact, they're not, okay? Steno. All right, this one's gonna be common to hospital equipment or contaminated blood drawing equipment. So all you phlebotomists need to be aware, okay? Um, oxidase negative, catalase positive. And it also is a big risk with the respiratory tract of hospitalized patients, okay? Again, people want antibiotics. Um, SXT is the drug of choice for most of these infections. And here's a picture of what it looks like. It looks like I have an arm, doesn't it? Okay. Burkholderia, a nosocomial pathogen, so a hospital fire. Uh, most often associated with pneumonia in patients with cystic fibrosis, okay? Um, it can cause a bunch of other things there, as you can see. And then they have specific auger, OFPBL auger is what it grows on, okay? Um, so that's basically the auger of choice when they suspect this guy. Um, you also can have wound infections, which would be a result from contaminated water. Uh, let's see. Okay, your next burkholderia. This one is going to be an aggressive pulmonary disease, okay? And that would be from inhalation or inoculation of the organism. And look at that, you have abscesses of the lung, septicemia can occur. Um, this one utilizes lactose, and what's used here is ash down auger to get that. Um, there's also something with this in terms of odor, supposedly has an earthy odor, whatever that means, I guess, outside, you know? And the colony actually looks wrinkled when it's observed. So when that's observed, they're actually looking more towards this guy if they see a wrinkled colony and it fits the other um, categories. And it's also a bioterrorism agent as well, which is really nice to know. Moraxella strongly oxidase positive on this one, okay? Susceptible to most penicillin. It's opportunistic and it actually resides on mucous membranes of humans. And this one's gonna resemble Neisseria most of the time, okay? That's actually a really cool picture of Marixella right there. And then these are just like basically points for you guys to remember um, for this lecture, okay, that most of these guys are environmental isolates um, and about the oxidase positive things. And one more, okay. And uh, the one too that's important here is that they colonize objects in solution, which is a problem because they're found in a lot of hospital equipment or environments, okay. And then you have your three most common ones listed up there as well. All right.